Hey there. Welcome back to the Healing Healthcare Burnout Podcast. I'm your host, Samantha Wilding, and we're doing something a little bit different today. We're learning lessons from a reactive dog. We're learning lessons from a reactive dog because actually canine reactivity and burnout share a lot of common features. And so, you know, first of all, um, this is Jasper. So we adopted Jasper uh, maybe six months ago. We're coming up on six months now. And what we didn't know at the time, uh, what the shelter didn't get a chance to tell us, is uh, how reactive he is with other dogs. So they knew he didn't do well with other dogs. They knew he would be better off in a single dog home. They didn't realize that uh, when they saw him in the shelter, he was actually pretty shut down. And so um, we meet him. You know, we, we drove about 50 miles out of our way, met this dog, fell in love with him, brought him home. And the next thing you know, uh, he's he's barking at everybody. He's barking at everything. He is uh, he's he's being a little bit of a handful. And um, we've had this journey of learning to help him behave in a way that is socially acceptable. So um, very sweet dog when he's not uh, actively barking at someone or actively uh, trying to defend us from what he perceives as a threat. And so um, the first thing to remember with, uh, with a reactive dog that also applies to burnout is the concept of threshold, right? The concept of threshold. So what is threshold? Um, Threshold is that point at which your body enters the fight, flight, freeze cycle. Threshold is that point beyond which your ability to self-regulate is deeply diminished by the extent to which you're in this physiological state. So when someone is above threshold, when you're above threshold, or when your dog is above threshold, normal rules of logic can't apply as effectively because the part of the brain that makes logical, rational, regulated decisions is shut down. Um, in dogs, it's much more marked than in humans, but in humans, we see this all the time. You know, we're constantly uh, coaching our clients. We're constantly showing our clients, how do you break out of that cycle? How do you break out of that moment where you can't think clearly because your emotions have crossed that threshold point? Uh, and it's it's a challenge that shows up in one of three ways. In humans, it shows up as fight, flight, or freeze. Right? So either we get frustrated, we snap, we snarl, we, we want to yell at somebody, we lose our cool, we blow up, something comes out that maybe shouldn't. Maybe we get anxious, scared, overwhelmed. We have that fear response deep in the stomach. Or maybe we freeze, maybe we shut down, maybe we have trouble <laughs> making decisions. That's Jasper, by the way, in the background that you're hearing. He, uh, he wants to be out of the office right now, <laughs> but he needs to stay in here like a good boy. Um, so that's the first thing that you can learn from a reactive dog is remembering this concept of threshold. When somebody is above their threshold, they are not in a place to reason. They're not in a place to listen. They're not in a place of making logical, rational choices. Emotion has taken over. And that happens to us. That happens to our patients. That happens to our colleagues. That happens to our teammates, right? So the first lesson is be conscious of threshold. Be conscious of where you are relative to your threshold. Um, the second thing, and this goes along with threshold, is this concept of trigger stacking. So trigger stacking is how recently and how frequently someone has been triggered to the point of threshold. Um, and where this matters, where this becomes a big deal, is in trigger stacking, that last thing that's setting something off isn't just that last thing, right? There's this history that's built up in the nervous system and it takes much, much longer to clear out stress and tension and challenge than it does to build up. And so being aware of how many stressful events you have been under or your patient has been under or your teammate has been under will give you a much better sense of how likely they are to react disproportionately to a new stressor, to a new environment, to a new challenge, to being asked to do something additional, 
right, to their demand level increasing if their ability to meet that demand hasn't increased proportionally. Um, and where stri trigger stacking really comes in is especially coming from leadership. So this is something that leaders really need to be more aware of when they're looking at their team is um, how often someone's circumstance has changed, how many times, how frequently that change is happening. Because ultimately, when we get into that space of, you know what, six things have changed in the last two days, that seventh thing may be enough to break the camel's back. It may be that extra straw that breaks the camel's back. And in our own lives, we need to be aware of our own background tension level, right? We carry this from space to space. We carry this from room to room. We carry this from home into work, and we carry it from work coming back home. And so oftentimes, we blow up in a situation over something tiny that shouldn't be the reason we blow up. It shouldn't be the reason we lose our cool. It is, and it only is, because the, the ways in which we have set ourselves up to not lose our cool have been overblown not once, not twice, but three or four times. Okay, trigger stacking is a big deal because it creates a chain where that last thing isn't just the one thing, it's everything that came before it. Now, you know, to deal with this, my, my clients and I deal with a, a concept called stress recovery, and we've talked about it a bunch of times on this podcast, is being able to find you know, what, what triggers have stacked in you already and learn how to put them down and clear that out so that you're not dealing with the fifth thing the same as the first thing. But most people don't have that skill set. Most people don't know how to do that. So of course, they stack and they stack. And that one little thing at the end, it's usually never about the one little thing that somebody blows up over. It's usually about the six things that happened before that. So being aware of trigger stacking and finding room for patience with people you know are actively trigger stacking, right? Um, which brings us kind of to point number three, which is, you know, meet people where they're at. Um, where people are, you know, whether whether we're talking about meeting the dog where he's at, or whether we're talking about what, meeting a team member where they're at, whether we're talking about meeting a friend where they're at, if they're feeling stressed out and overwhelmed and that's showing up with you, being able to meet someone where they're at is a skill set of not expecting them to perform to your level, not expecting someone to come to exactly where you are right away. Um, it's about being able to look at somebody and saying, okay, you know, there's a gap between where somebody is and where they need to be in order to meet some requirement or fulfill some expectation. But it's usually not one thing, right? It's usually not, oh, Jessie's perfect, except her documentation. You know, she needs to add commas at the end, you know, to, to delineate her, her clauses in her sentences, right? It's not one thing. It's usually multiple things that create this performance gap, right? We're usually pretty tolerant of single small issues. But saying, this is where the standard is, why aren't you here, ignores the fact that there is a journey that has to happen from the point where somebody begins to the point where somebody winds up, right? There's a journey that has to happen from where somebody is to where we want them to get to. And so when we meet people where they're at, instead of it holding them to the highest standard, what winds up happening is we leave space for them to grow. And we can appreciate that somebody's growth is not necessarily the same thing as getting to where we want them to be right away. It might take two years for somebody to get into that space of being the person we need them to be on our team. You know, with this dog, if we held him to the standards, if we held this poor little guy to the standards of you will never bark at another dog and you will um, always sit politely when a stranger tries to meet you and uh, you, will, you will leave every treat you find on the ground right away all the time, that standard is not a realistic one for where he was at. This guy, you know, we're his fifth home in a year. And he's been in at least three shelters. So if Jasper can't, can't get to that place of perfection, we don't just give up on training the dog. You have to say, okay, what is he good at? What's the next step of taking that towards where you want him to be? So you know what? We're not as focused on leave it as we are on being able to sit 
right? Maybe, maybe you need to teach sit before you teach leave it. <laughs> There's that basic communication that has to get built. But if you put too much pressure to grow too fast, that communication falls apart. And this matters a lot when you're talking about dealing with your teammates. It matters a lot when you're talking about dealing with, you know, friends or family members where you want them to, to grow to a certain place, but maybe you're not always giving them the time and the effort that they need to get to where they want to be. So instead of asking, where should somebody be? Ask what's the next step for them to get to where they need to be and focus on that. Um, and that leads to kind of really one of the biggest pieces, which is the golden rule of dog training, right? The golden rule of dog training. This is me and Jasper chilling by the door. Uh, we, we call this doggy meditation, by the way, because he's so reactive to things outside. He needs a chance to see that the thing that's you know going down the street is just going down the street. He needs a chance to hear that the bird rustling in the bushes is just a bird and it's not going to attack the house. So yeah, we're sitting here doing a little doggy meditation in this photo. Um, but the golden rule of training is something that our trainers kind of had to pound into our heads again and again and again. And it's the simplest thing in the world and it applies everywhere. Okay, here's the golden rule of dog training. Ready? Reward what you want. If a dog gives you a behavior that you want, give him a treat. If your coworker helps you out with something, say thank you. Say, hey, you really helped me out. If your partner covers for you when you have a headache and they take the, the reactive dog out for a walk first thing in the morning, you say, thank you, honey. I really appreciate that you helped me out, right? Reward what you want. That's part, that's part one. Reward the good things. Reward anything you want to see more of. And it is amazing how often we don't do this in healthcare. It is amazing how often we don't reward the things we want from our patients, from our colleagues, from our bosses. Oh, hello. The flip side of this is, what behaviors are you rewarding that you don't like? What behaviors are you giving attention to? What behaviors are you validating that you don't want? So what behavior are you validating that you don't want? Reward what you want. Well, if you want your boss to stop asking you to cover that extra shift of overtime and making you feel guilty, stop saying yes, right? Stop saying yes to the behaviors you don't want. In fact, the second rule of dog training is ignore what you don't want. So reward what you like, ignore what you don't. Not punish, not demean, not belittle, not snap at, not argue with. Reward what you want and ignore what you don't want. The reason ignoring things works so well is that it is the politest, most subtle way of saying no. So if you can ignore something that somebody is doing, right? If somebody, let's say you have a coworker who is constantly complaining, they're constantly complaining and they come to you and they ask, yeah, hey, did you see this thing? Oh my God, what's, what's going on with that? And if you don't reward that behavior, it is less likely to happen in the future. Why? Because maybe you reward something else. Maybe you reward the times that they help you out, but you don't reward the times that they complain. You don't reward the times that they say something snippy or something snide. The reward in those cases is often just acknowledgement of the thing that they did that garnered attention in the first place. So the less you acknowledge the thing that you don't want, the less often it is likely to happen. This happens you know, in terms of dogs with Jasper. You know, when he barks at the door, it took us so long to get to a place of being able to ignore that rather than telling him no or quiet or hush, right? You wanna say those things because you want the behavior to stop, but ultimately the attention is the reward in so many cases. And it's the case in so many ways at work. So stop rewarding the behavior you don't want. Stop rewarding your boss for asking you for overtime. Stop rewarding your coworker who comes to you and starts complaining. Stop rewarding the patient who keeps demanding things and demanding things and demanding things. Stop rewarding the behavior you don't want. Now, there is a catch, right? Reward what you want, ignore what you don't, but manage the things you can't ignore. So for example, if your patient you know, starts attacking you with, I don't know, the their meal tray, yeah, you got to manage that behavior, right? 
whether that's verbal de-escalation, whether that's asking for security, whether that's four point, whatever it is, manage what you can't ignore because there will be things you can't ignore. So of course, we're not going to let him off the leash. We're not going to ignore the fact that he tries to chase a cat every time we're out in the street, right? <laughs> this little guy, he is, he's half Weimaraner. He has a very strong prey drive. He wants to go after small animals. That's what's in his DNA. It's what he was bred to do for thousands of years. It's a behavior that we can't ignore because it presents a safety issue. So what do we do, right? We intervene in a non-confrontational way. So instead of just pulling directly against his momentum, we'll actually pull orthogonal to it. We'll pull it at a 90 degree angle. So um, there's a technique in dog training called circle walking, where if the dog is pulling this way, you redirect the angle and you get them to use that momentum to go in a circle. You get them to use that momentum to come around. It's almost like dog jujitsu, right? You can use verbal jujitsu. Don't, don't meet force with force. Meet force with gentle redirection. You can meet conversational force with gentle redirection rather than meeting it head on all the time. You can redirect somebody's attention rather than saying yes to something that you don't want to do. Oh, wow. You know, I'm, I'm completely at my bandwidth right here. Who else can help you with that? You didn't fight it. You didn't butt heads. You just redirected it, right? It's, it's verbal jujitsu. So fourth thing is the golden rule of dog training. Reward, reward what you like, ignore what you don't, manage what you can not ignore. And the fifth rule, uh, the fifth lesson to learn from a reactive dog is don't forget to nap. Naps are incredible. Um, and I'm going to use nap here in a broader sense, right? <laughs> Naps talking, I'm talking about rest. I'm talking about taking the time to recover between stressful events. I'm talking about taking moments like this to just lie in the sun and enjoy yourself. I'm talking about taking moments to appreciate the things that you have, to appreciate the things that are going right, to appreciate what's going well, to acknowledge that yes, there are scary things outside. Or there, there is a lot going on at work. Yes, there are, there are staffing challenges. There are rule challenges. There are tricky managers. There are challenging coworkers. Of course, those things are all true. And there are also sunny days with a nice warm place to curl up and take a nap, right? There, there are good things to enjoy, even in the context of, of everything that could go wrong. Um, and don't forget to take the moments of pleasure where you can find them. You know, if you have a dog, go pet your dog. If you have a partner, cuddle up, spend some time. Hey, honey, can we put our phones down? I want to smooch you. I want to smooch you. Right? You can take those moments and appreciate them and enjoy them and have those little miniature vacations. Um, one thing I'll often tell my clients to do when they're working on a busy floor and they can't get away and take a nap or they can't get away and, and you know connect with somebody, even just take one breath. There is no situation. I've, I've worked every kind of code you can imagine. There is no situation in healthcare where you can't take one breath to settle yourself. Doesn't exist. Take a breath. If that is as big of a break as you can take, take a breath break. Take one deep breath. If that is the, the smallest viable break that you have, great. Take it. Take it before you walk in the room. Take it before you clock out. Take it before you clock in. Take it before you get in the car. Take one single breath to relax. Because it is not as stressful as we make it out to be. And I know that that is a really hard concept to manage. That's a really hard concept to swallow. But most of the time, it's our reactions to things that make things worse than they already are. So I hope this was helpful. I hope this was useful. Um... And I just wanted to share pictures of my puppy. <laughs> you guys have a beautiful day. <laughs>